I'd invite you to open your Bibles with me to John chapter 13. John's Gospel chapter 13. In the year 125, Aristides is writing a defense of Christianity to the Roman Emperor Hadrian. Describing the Christians, he writes, But the Christians, O King, know and trust in God, the creator of heaven and of earth, from whom they received commandments which they engraved upon their minds and observe in hope and expectation of the world which is to come. Wherefore, they do not commit adultery, nor fornication, nor bear false witness, nor embezzle what is held in pledge, nor covet what is not theirs. They honor father and mother, and show kindness to those near to them. And whenever they are judges, they judge uprightly. They do not worship idols made in the image of man, and whatsoever they would not of, that others should do unto them, they do not to others. They do good to their enemies. And their women, O king, are pure as virgins, and their daughters are modest. And their men keep themselves from every unlawful union and from all uncleanness, in the hope of a recompense to come in the other world. Falsehood is not found among them. And they love one another. And when they see a stranger, they take him into their homes and rejoice over him as a very brother. For they do not call them brethren after the flesh, but brethren after the Spirit of God. And if they hear that one of their number is imprisoned or afflicted on account of the name of their Messiah, all of them anxiously minister to his necessity. And if it is possible to redeem him, they set him free. And if there is among them any that is poor and needy, and if they have no spare food, they fast two or three days in order to supply to the needy their lack of food. By far, the commandment to love one another is recorded in the New Testament many more times than any other of the one another commandments. Jesus gives the commandment to his disciples. Paul addresses the subject in several of his letters. The writer of Hebrews mentions brotherly love. Peter commands it, and of course John, the apostle of love, fills his writings with commandments to love one another. Why the New Testament emphasis on Christians loving one another. We're told to bear with one another, forgive one another, encourage one another, serve one another, and so many other commands that we're given. Why love? Why, why is that the emphasis? Well, Jesus said that the one characteristic that would distinguish his disciples from those who are not his disciples is the evidence that they love one another. Of course, this is in John chapter 13 and verses 34 and 35, where Jesus says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Jesus didn't say that all people will know you are my disciples if you're holy or righteous or spiritually minded. He says that your love for one another will set you apart as my followers. Again, why the emphasis on love? Well, we find the answer rather quickly in our New Testament as we read, right? Because John says in 1 John 4, 7 and 8, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God. Why? Because God is love. God 
in his very nature is love. And love is from God. And if anyone truly loves, that person is born of God, we're told, and, and he knows God. Of course, being born of God means to be born again or born above these other uh, ways that is, is referenced in the New Testament. It's speaking of a, a new spiritual life in Christ. The one who is born of the Spirit knows God intimately. He has personal knowledge of God based upon his relationship with God. So John says in 1 John 4, 19 and 20 through 21, we love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. So John says that if you do not have love then you do not know God. As simple as that. You may say to yourself and you may say to others, well, I know God. I know Jesus. He's my Savior. And you may think that you have eternal life. But the Scriptures make it clear that if you don't love your fellow Christian, then you don't love God. John says if you say you love God, but there's no evidence in your life that, that you actually love his people, then you're a liar. I mean, that's strong language. That's not my language. That's the language of the Spirit of God through the Apostle John. If the love of God is not in you, then you don't even know who God is. Love is the necessary characteristic of a genuine Christian. If you don't have love in your heart, if you don't love other Christians, then you don't know God. You may say you do, but if, if you don't have love, then you're a liar. So what is love? Well, the, the Greek word used for the love of God in usually used in reference to Christians loving one another, of course, is the word agape that I think we're, most of us are familiar with. And, and this love is the love that God loves us with. It, it's, it, it's the love that he expects us to love him with. And it's the kind of love that require, he requires of us that we love one another. So, so what is Agape. What, what is biblical love? Well, it's been said that love is more easily described than defined. In fact, that's exactly what Paul does in 1 Corinthians 13. He describes it. He describes, describes how love behaves. And we'll go there shortly. But before we go there, let, let's look at a definition of love. Um, one theologian in his in his um, systematic theology book, Christian Theology, Millard Erickson writes, God's love may be thought of as his eternal giving or sharing of himself. In another theology book, um, Elemental Theology by Bancroft, he says, love is that attribute of God by which he is inclined to seek the highest good for his creatures and the communication of himself to them regardless of the sacrifice involved. And we could say it this way, God's love is the sharing of himself with others. It's his willingness to sacrifice himself for the good of others. Is, is this not exactly what he has done? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, right? He gave his only son. That, that's, God is going to demonstrate his love to the world. And he says, this is how I'm going to do it. I am going to give myself. And the person of the, the, third, the, the second person of the Trinity, Jesus, the son, I am going to give myself as a sacrifice. He gave himself. 
And that's where love begins, right? That's, that's where it all starts. Is if we want to know what love is, it starts with God. It's the giving of himself. He, he's giving himself. He's sacrificing himself so that he can save us lost sinners from our sin. That, that's, what, that's where we need to understand love. And if, if we don't understand the gospel, if we don't understand God's love and the gospel and the giving of his son, then, then we're never going to be able to understand our love for God. And as we're looking at this morning, our love for one another. What's that supposed to look like? The commandment for us to love one another as Christians is essentially a commandment to share our lives with one another. That's what God did. He sacrificially shared himself for us. We're, we're told that to love is to share what we have with one another. I mean, this is, again, John in 1 John 3, 16 and 17. By this we know love that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has this world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? You see, if a professing Christian is not willing to share what he has with another Christian who's in need, then, then he doesn't have the love of God within himself. Love is sharing. It's sharing what one has. It's the sharing of one's life with others. That's essentially what love is. You remember the parable of the Good Samaritan found in Luke chapter 10. You know, Jesus is talking about loving your neighbor. And the question that the inquirer comes back with is, well, who is my neighbor? And, and, and Jesus tells them this parable about this man who's beaten, right? And left on the road to die. He's robbed and beaten. And, and it's this, this Samaritan, the, the priest, the Levite, they pass by. They just they don't do anything to help him. But, but this Samaritan, the, who was despised by the Jews, he stops. What does he do? He, he's loving his neighbor. His, his neighbor is this man who was beaten and left to die alongside the road. And this Samaritan, he's, he's showing what love is to a neighbor... He's showing what love is. How? Well, he's sacrificing of himself, right? He's giving his time. He, he takes him to an inn. And he says, look, I'll pay the bill for this guy until he's able to get out of here and be on his own. He's sharing his money. He's, he's giving him of himself. Everything that's his, he's giving to this man who is in need. And Jesus uses this as an illustration. This is what love is. Love isn't just words. Love isn't just feelings. Love is action. Love is the giving of oneself to others, a sacrificial giving. So how does God demonstrate his love? How does God share? Well, ultimately, as I said, it, it's at the cross. It's where Jesus was given, where he was sacrificed for us, for our good, for our salvation. But, but how does God share of himself as, as, as we go through our lives? Well, I mean, there, we could spend a, a lot of time here, of course, but just some different ways he does is he shows mercy, right? He withholds deserved penalty and he relieves suffering. So much suffering in the world. And, and we hear testimonies of, of people receiving the mercy of God. And we, obviously, his mercies are new every morning. God's mercy is an outpouring. It's, it's, a, it's a demonstration of his love. We, he doesn't give us what we deserve. And, and aren't we thankful for that? But he, he relieves suffering. Of course, his grace, he, he shows his unmerited, undeserved favor. In, in salvation, yes, he saves us from our sin through the sacrifice of his son. But, 
but grace upon grace we're given day after day after day. God blesses us with, with so much that we don't deserve. We could never earn. That's part of his love. His benevolence. God is concerned for the welfare of those whom he loves. So he, he's good to us. He's good to people in general. He causes the, the rain to, to come down and the sun to shine on, on both the just and the unjust. In his long suffering, he withholds judgment and, and continues to offer grace to offenders. He's long suffering with us. And, and these are just, you know, some demonstrations of God's love that, that we see every day of our lives. In our own lives and in the lives of, of others. All undeserving of his love. It's, it's his own giving of himself, the sacrifice that he makes for us and for others. So again, why, why the emphasis now on loving one another? Well, I really think it's, it's twofold. And first of all, we, we touched on this. Since God is love, the true love of God shown for, forth in believers' lives shows others what God is like. God is love. So, so when we as Christians are loving one another, we're loving others, then that is demonstrating to everyone else, this is what God is like. These are followers of God. These are followers of Christ. This, this, is, what, this is what God is like. God is love. And also, secondly, loving one another encompasses the, the entirety of our Christian responsibilities to one another as Christians. We, we looked at all of these one another commandments in, in this um, series we're doing. We, we at least briefly covered uh, most of them. And, and there's so many of them, but, but love is really the one that, that just encompasses everything. Because lo love is of the utmost importance because God is love. His very being consists of love. And he desires to share himself with others, and, and he demands the same thing of his people. In fact, the, the Lord refers to the two commandments, to love God supremely and to love others earnestly, as the greatest, the most important commandments. And the New Testament repeatedly tells us that, that these two commandments, loving God and loving others, are the very embodiment and fulfillment of God's law. It, and we, we understand, right, the law is, is a reflection of who God is. You read the Old Testament, you read the law as it's given there in those first five books of the Bible, and you understand this is who God is. All of these laws reflect God, and, and particularly in the Ten Commandments, right? These, are, these laws aren't just random laws that God said, okay, I think these will be good. No, these are reflections of his character, of who he is. In Luke 10, 27, we read, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. So these two commandments are taken from the law. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5, and Leviticus 19 and verse 18. And, and the first is that, that we should love God with all of, our, all of our being. First of all, our heart, which involves our, our will and our emotion. We should love God with our soul, our, our, the very inner being within us. We should love him with all of our strength, that is, our, our might. And we should love him with our mind, our intellect, our entire being. Our entire life should be dedicated to loving God with all that we are. Love him with, with, with all that he has given you, everything that you are. This is the greatest commandment, that, that we love God with our whole being. 
in Mark and Matthew, they give us some more insight on, into this truth. And in, in Mark chapter 12, uh, verses 30 and 31, we read, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And second is this, that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. He says, there is no other commandment greater than these. No other commandment. Now, now I want you to think about that. There's no other commandment greater than these. Be ye holy as I am holy. Now that is a great commandment. That, that is something that, that we, we should strive for, right? That, that's the Old Testament, and it's quoted in the New Testament, right? Be holy as I am holy. You're my people. I'm holy. You be holy as I am holy. Well, Jesus said that this commandment's greater than that one. The greatest commandment is actually twofold, to love God supremely and to love others earnestly. There's no commandment that takes precedence over these two commandments to love God and to love others. Obviously, we need to be holy. We need to strive to, to be holy as God is holy. But, but this is the greatest commandment. These are Jesus' words. And then, in fact, if, if you know verse 33 there, in Mark 12, um, he says, and to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding, with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. So you, you want to know how, how great this is to, to love God and to love your neighbor as yourself? Well, anything that you could do, the giving of any any offering, any sacrifice that you could make of, of anything that you have, that is not even comparable to loving God and loving others. In fact, the, the sum total of all the offerings and all the sacrifices that you could ever make would not equal your keeping of these two commandments. No wonder he says these are the most the two most important commandments, loving God and loving others. Note also what Matthew records in Matthew 22, 36 through 40. Again, similar words, but he, he adds something else here. He says, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then he says this, on these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. The word, the word depend means to suspend. To suspend. Something that's hanging or being suspended is being supported by the object on which it's suspended. So Jesus is saying here that all the law and all the prophets... All of the Old Testament revelation that had been given up to that time when Jesus walked the earth, he said all of that, the entire Old Testament, is, is hanging upon these two commandments. Everything else, they're, they're up there and everything else is hanging off them. It's, it's, it's suspended by them. So, the entire law is summed up with these two commandments. Love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love others like you love yourself. In every law of God regarding how we should treat God, what should be our attitude toward God, what should be our actions toward God, how we should treat other people, in our thinking, in our speech, in our actions, it, it, it's all hanging upon this one thing, these two commandments. I mean, Paul says the same thing in Romans, Romans 13, in verses 8 through 10. He says, Owe no one anything except to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. 
And, and the idea of fulfilling the law is, is to cause God's will, to cause his law to be obeyed as it should be. That's what to fulfill means. So in Matthew and Mark, Jesus said that the second commandment is like the first commandment. And these two commandments are inseparable. Remember what Jesus said to his disciples where we started off. A new commandment I give to you. That you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Christians loving one another is the evidence to the world that they are true disciples of Jesus Christ. So, so, so just, you just follow. It, it, it's, so, it's really so logical. It, it, it's not mysterious. It's not hard to understand. It, it, it's really simple logic. God loves us. 1 John 4, 19, right? We love or we love him because he first loved us. That's where it all starts. God loves us. And then it moves on, right? We, we because he loves us, we're, we're, we are to love him with our entire being, with all of our faculties, all of our affections, all that we are. We should love the Lord our God because of his great love for us. And then it, it moves on, you know, because God loves us and, and we love God, we we need to love our neighbor as ourselves. So John can say in verse 20, 1 John 4, if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. It's impossible. It's impossible. And there are a lot of people out there who say they're Christians who, who hate other Christians. And, and they say they love God. And John says, no, that's not, it's not possible. You, can't, you cannot do that. It's an impossibility. The evidence of loving God is displayed by one's love for others. I, I like how one writer put it. He said, love for God is difficult to see, but love for others is subject to relational verification. Someone can say he loves God and they can do things that might look like they do love God. Uh, they can go to church. They can talk about spiritual things. They can read their Bible. They can appear to be a spiritually minded person. But one's love for God is not the easiest thing to measure, right? However, the way a person treats other people is much easier to see. If he truly loves other people, then it's going to be evident in his relationships. It's going to be evident in his family, with his friends, with his neighbors, with his co-workers. And if you take Jesus' teaching into account in the apostles, even with his enemies. And that's why Paul writes in Galatians 5.14, For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Because if you, if you love your neighbor, then you're loving, you know, then if you're truly loving your neighbor, if you're truly loving other believers specifically in the light of what we're looking at today, then, then that, that gives evidence that you do love God. And when we come to 1 Corinthians 13, what we see here is that... Uh, Paul, Paul essentially describes love, and, and we, we see that the definition of love is, is the sharing of oneself and the sacrificing of one, oneself for other, other people. So if you look at 1 Corinthians 13, um, I'm out here. I'm sorry, excuse me. It's never good when you're in your notes and you come 
Oh, I'm sorry. The page was flipped over. Here we go. We're, we're good now. I had a blank page, and I'm thinking, huh. There we go. So, um, I don't know if that was a senior moment or not, but um, it was a bad moment. You, you can't have one without the other, right? You, you can't love God and not love people. You can't love people and not love God. I mean, you can say you do, but what, really what is it? Because love for people without a love for God, and, and there are people that have a certain you know, measure of love for people who don't love God, at least they, they would communicate that they do, but, but that's essentially just humanism, right? Those who would say they love, love people but they don't love God, that, that's the essence of humanism. But love for God without love for people is what? It's hypocrisy. It, it's simple hypocrisy. So, so how is God's love manifested in, in Christians? Well, it's interesting that Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians 4, 9 that concerning brotherly love, he says, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. Taught by God is, is an interesting phrase in that it, it's used only here in the New Testament. There isn't no other place it's used. And, and it signifies the teaching in their hearts by God himself and that's through the indwelling spirit, right? Christians love for one another is, is a quality that the spirit of God himself teaches those who have been born again. Peter says in 2 Peter 1, 4 that Christians are partakers of the divine nature. He says, and Paul says in Colossians 1.27 that Christ is in us. And, and in 1 Corinthians 6.19 that the Holy Spirit indwells us. So God himself, Jesus Christ himself, in the person of the Holy Spirit, lives within the very being of a genuine Christian. And, and God, by nature, is, is love. Because love is not merely a quality that God possesses, but rather his very nature, it's impossible for a Christian to not have love in his heart. If he, does, if he doesn't have love in his heart, he doesn't know Christ. 1 John 3.14 We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. So, so like the Thessalonians were, were taught by God, by his indwelling spirit, to love one another. It, it's the very nature of, of Christianity. So if we're loving one another as we should, what does that look like? How will it actually be, be manifested in our lives? Well, again, when we come to 1 Corinthians 13... Um, where Paul essentially describes love, we, we see that, that the definition of love as, as the sharing of oneself and the sacrifice of oneself for others, it fits Paul's description. That's a good definition of love. The, the giving of oneself, the sharing of oneself, the sacrifice of oneself for others, on behalf of others. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 13. Let's just, let's just read beginning in the first seven verses here. Paul says, and he's, he's speaking about spiritual gifts, right? This is right in the midst of a, a passage on spiritual gifts. And he says in, in 1 Corinthians 13, 1, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all that I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. 
So again, he's saying what, what, what we alluded to earlier, right? It doesn't matter what, what you do. It doesn't matter what sacrifices you make. It doesn't matter what gifts you might have that, that you are employing in use. It doesn't matter. Nothing that, not, none of that matters if you don't have love. And then he goes on to describe love. He says love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. So here, here are, in this passage, we have 16 descriptions of love. And, and you'll know each one of them is an active giving of self or a sacrificing of self. Because loving others is, involves giving up the presumed right to our own sense of individual importance. It gives up the presumed right of our own feelings, our own desires, and even our own possessions. That's what love is. That's what love is. Love is saying, you know, I, I think I have a right to this. I think this is mine. I can do with it what I want. That, that, that's that's the, the, the general human thinking process. But love says no. Actually, you need to be willing to sacrifice, to give everything that you think is yours to others for their good. You go down through here. Just We'll, we'll look down through this list. Um, we won't spend much time here, but we'll, we'll go through the list. He says love is patient. In other words, it has a, an infinite capacity for endurance. It's not readily put out. You're patient. Patience is a manifestation of love. Love is kind. That means it's gracious. It's, it's gentle. It, it's good and accommodating. Even to those who, who maltreat it. Love doesn't envy. It doesn't envy. It doesn't have an exalted. It doesn't have a strong passion of jealousy. It's not displeased at the success of others. Um, as I put here, you know, life is full of inequities, right? You, the sooner we figure that out, hopefully the better it is for us. So it's, everything's not right in this world, right? Um, we talk about equality a lot in, in our nation here, but, but it, it doesn't matter. There, there, are, there, are, in, there are inequalities. There, there's a lot that, that happens that it's not right. And we need to understand that. There, there's always going to be someone who's better than you at something. Right? There's always going to be someone. Better. And there are always going to be people that maybe they aren't as good as you, but, but maybe they're still going to get the promotion. Right? Um, love doesn't envy. It doesn't boast. It doesn't have a, an exalted view of oneself. It doesn't brag or or prayed itself before others, or, or push its own opinion upon people. It's not arrogant. It doesn't puff itself up. It, it doesn't have feelings of pride. It's not ostentatious, always wanting to, to show how great one is. It's not rude, and it means it doesn't behave in a way that's disgraceful or dishonorable or indecent. It doesn't call attention to itself. It doesn't insist on its own way. It's, it's self-forgetful. You know, the, the, the natural mind, the human fallen nature is, is such that we, we do insist on our own way. We don't want to forget ourselves and what we really want in a situation. But love doesn't insist on its own way. Nor is it irritable or resentful. 
It's not touchy. It's not easily offended. It's, it's not easily provoked or exasperated. It doesn't rejoice at wrongdoing. It takes no joy in evil. It's not indulgent of others' wrongdoing like, like the Corinthians were with a situation in their church when a man had taken his father's wife and they were boasting about it. Love doesn't do that. Love doesn't rejoice at wrongdoing. Not openly and not secretly. Love rejoices with the truth because, because love can't rejoice when the truth is denied. You can't separate truth from love. Love bears all things. It, it covers or, or suffers all things. It's not overwhelmed. It doesn't dwell on sin when, when someone has done wrong. You grant forgiveness, as we saw in the last couple of Sundays, and you move on. Love believes all things. It's always ready to give the benefit of the, of the doubt. It accepts people's word. It prefers to be generous and trusting rather than suspicious. Love hopes all things. And, and this isn't speaking of an, an unreasoning optimism, but rather a refusal to take failure as final. Um, there, there's a confidence which, which looks for the ultimate triumph by the grace of God, there's, there's always hopeful, ex expecting the best. And it endures all things. It's steadfast. It endures hardships for the sake of others. Love never ends. It's eternal. And, and you know, you go back down through this list, and, and, and if you're honest, you're going to say, phew, I struggle with this one. I'm not really being patient. Man, that's hard for me kind well mm. uh, not envying I mean you, you just just pick your own right you know yourself pretty well you can tell uh, what you know where your struggles are but but again Paul's describing love here he, he's saying th this is what love looks like are, are we all going to perfectly love one another obviously not but, but this, is what, this is what should characterize our lives. We should be growing in these areas. You know, if you've, if you've got somebody, or if you yourself say, I'm a Christian, but you know what? I don't, I don't care. This is my right. I'm going to do this. I'm going to maintain this attitude. You know, I, I've been told I'm arrogant. I've been told I'm proud. Well, you know, I'm not, I'm not worried about it. I know I'm unkind, but you know, that's just the way I am. You've got, you've got a problem. You've got a serious spiritual issue. You, you may not know God. You may not know him if you, if you don't love your brothers and sisters in Christ. But at the very least, you, you've got some areas that you need to turn over to God and, and seek God for help in, you know, and, and we all do. But we need to understand that, that Jesus Christ loves us. God the Father loves us with this kind of love. This kind of love that's described here in 1 Corinthians 13. And he demonstrated that love on the cross at Calvary. Our sins are forgiven as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Our sins are forgiven. Our debts are paid. Our future is secure because of the love of God in Jesus, God's Son. God's love for us, as His forgiveness frees us to forgive others, His love frees us to love others. Because God loves us in spite of our sins and our shortcomings. And by His grace, we can love one another in spite of of our and others' sins and annoyances. Because we're all sinners. We're all sinners. And those of us who are saved are just sinners saved by grace. And we must love one another. 
and you know, I, I look at our church here and, and, and I, you know, I'm, I'm thankful because I, I believe that um, this is a church that we truly do love one another. We truly do love one another. But do we need to grow in that? Well, obviously we do. In fact, Paul commended the Thessalonian church for their love, right? He commended them for their love for one another, yet he still admonished them to, to grow in their love for one another. In, in 1 Thessalonians 3.12, he said, May the Lord make you increase and abound to overflow in love for one another and for all. Not only for other believers, but for all. Your unsaved neighbor as well. He, he says again in the next chapter, he says, Now concerning brotherly love, you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another, for that indeed is what you are doing. And then he says, But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more. See, Paul said in Romans 13 that it's a debt that we owe. The debt of loving one another. And, and it's something that we should, we should constantly be reminding ourselves of. That we are to love one another, starting in our homes with our spouse, with our children, with our parents, expanding that out to our church and to our, our co-workers and our friends and our neighbors. We, we are to love one another. We are to love one another even as God loves us. And understanding that gospel message of God's love for us in Christ is where it all begins. You lack love? Of course you do. We all do. We're selfish. We fight it. And... and, and and by looking to the cross and looking at what God has done for us and understanding this is what I'm, this, God says, this is what I'm, this is what I am commanding of you, that you love one another as I have loved you. So I pray that God would help us to, to increase, to abound in our love for one another as believers. Because the vision for our church is that we would be a community-minded church loving one another even as Jesus loves us. That's the standard he's given us. That's the call he's given us. May God give us the grace to, to continue to grow in our love for one another. Thank you, Lord, that you have called us to follow you as your people that you have called us to love you and to love others. Help us, Lord, to grow and abound in our love for one another. May we look to the cross to see what genuine love is. And may we cry out to you and trust in you for your grace to increase in our love for one another. In Jesus' name, amen.